Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. Folks, I don't like to toot my own horn. You all know that. So it is with some hesitation I am pulling the curtain aside to reveal my channel's dangly bits so that I might toot myself today. This is the monetization page for a YouTube video as it stands today. And these are my typical settings set thusly because my MO for how I do YouTube is to generally not do things that I myself would not like or appreciate. I am not a big fan of ads, but I recognize that they help support many channels, including my own, so I do turn ads on, skippable ads that is, but I disable non-skippable ads as well as mid-rolls. And that's despite YouTube telling me many, many times that mid-rolls could make them and me by extension more money. But I hate it when a mid-roll pops up and interrupts a video almost as much as I hate non-skippable ads. But YouTube has decided that starting in November, they will make the call instead of me about what ads to serve. Now I can at least still opt out of mid-rolls it seems, which I intend to do. But before these changes roll out, I wanted to apologize in advance to anyone who might get served a stupid long ad at the beginning of one of my videos starting next month and to recommend Firefox and uBlock Origin for better control over how your eyeballs are sold on the internet. But thanks for letting me get that off my chest. And now, on with the tech news. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by Micro Center. This is one of my favorite places to buy PC parts. So if you're building or upgrading your PC, I highly recommend making your way down to one of their 25 retail stores in the US. They have consistently competitive prices and an excellent selection of PC hardware and other tech goodies. And they have a custom PC builder on the Micro Center website. Use it to spec out your rig and it will show you parts in store at your nearest location while ensuring compatibility. Then you can pick up in store or have their pros assemble it for you. So click the sponsor link in the description to find a Micro Center near you. Speaking of tooting my own horn, did you note that I always put timestamps on all my videos too, with a chapter starting after my burned in ad integrations, so you can easily skip that as well? Double tap with two fingers to jump to the next chapter if you're on mobile. I talked last week about how there aren't a ton of big launches expected in Q4, but what launches might actually happen? Enthusiasts with deep pockets might be excited to hear that the Threadripper Pro 7000 series of CPUs are rumored to launch October 19th. These Zen 4 based processors, codenamed Storm Peak, will sport as many as 96 cores and 192 threads, 384 megabytes of cache, and 128 PCI Express Gen five lanes combined with eight or four channel DDR5 support via the new platform, which comes in TRX50 or WRX50 variants. But with the launch only about a week and a half away, there have been precious few leakages of new motherboards, apart from an ASRock TRX50 model outed by EEC listings back in September. So don't be surprised if Threadripper Pro 7000 debuts as an OEM only option, with DIY options limited to somewhere between zero and none, unless you want to purchase and disassemble a 10 to $20,000 plus pre-built workstation from an enterprise integrator like Lenovo or HP. Last generation Threadripper Pro 5000 series CPUs were out for about five months via OEMs before they were made available to the public as a standalone purchase, which is partially why pricing for the 7000 series is still a mystery. And consider that the Threadripper 5000 series flagship, the Ryzen Threadripper 5995WX, listed for $6,500 initially, and it still goes for over $6,000 today. So if this rumor is true, the launch will likely be subdued for the DIY crowd due to pricing and availability. But all that aside, I am still quite curious to see what the 96 core Threadripper Pro 7995WX can do. Another launch that could be happening soon is Intel's Arc A580 GPU, the middle child in the Arc lineup that has been notably missing since it was announced more than a year ago. Videocards.com went so far as to claim that the GPU had likely been shelved after it no-showed at Intel's innovation event in September, but hope has been renewed thanks to listings spotted by the nefarious Twitter user known as Momomo underscore US. One listing is from the German price comparison site Giz 
Cells, where an ASRock Challenger OC model can be found, and Sparkle apparently also shared images of their A580 Orc with videocards.com directly. Both GPUs are two fan, two slot cards with dual eight pin peg power connectors, despite their supposed 175 watt TDP. So now the real question, apart from the actual launch date of course, is how much these will cost given that the ARC A750 has now seen sale prices below $200. If the A580 is $150 or even $170, bucks, it could become a go-to for entry-level builds. And it even has 8GB of VRAM, just like Nvidia's RTX 4060 Ti, which costs $400. It is perhaps a symptom of the lack of big PC hardware launches that I will now be talking about phones, specifically the Google Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro, which were announced at their event on Wednesday, along with an updated Pixel Watch 2. Pricing is $700 for the Pixel 8 and $1,000 for the 8 Pro, 100 bucks more than the Pixel 7 was at launch, but those phones weren't designed for the generative AI era, nor did they feature the latest Tensor G3 processor, which can do AI better so you can AI your pictures and ultimately use the term AI as frequently as possible in your presentation. The Pixel 8 sports a 6.1 inch 1080 by 2400 display with 2000 nits peak brightness. The 8 Pro is 6.8 inches, 1344 by 2992 resolution and 2400 nits brightness. Both screens can go up to 120 hertz refresh rate too. The temperature sensor is a unique feature on these phones, but I question just how close you need to get it to say boiling liquid to get an accurate reading. And there are some software tricks to pair with the upgraded 50 megapixel main camera, such as computational audio that can remove background noises from a video such as a barking dog or the best take photo replacement tool that lets you choose faces from a series of shots and swap them in so you can actually get a family photo where no one is sneezing and none of the kids are making those faces that kids like to make during family photos. And while that feature itself probably makes it worth the price for some parents, I was most intrigued by Google's promise to provide seven years of software updates for the Pixel 8 and not just security patches but OS and feature updates as well. It seems like a push away from the trend of getting a new phone every year, which is why I will not be getting a Pixel 8, because I still have a Pixel 6, and it works just fine. Speaking of things that work just fine, putting the shorter stories in the latter half of the show just kind of makes sense, and hence we have tech briefs. AMD's FSR3 with fluid motion frames, aka frame generation, debuted late last week without much in the way of official review, as it is still technically a preview release. But as we might have expected, Tim over at Hardware Unboxed posted an assessment of FSR3 on Friday, and it's not quite a glowing review. There are multiple frame pacing problems, VSync off is broken currently, and a variable refresh rate only really works if the output frame rate is higher than your monitor's refresh rate, severely limiting the tech's useful application depending on your hardware setup, refresh rate, and resolution of course. And while FSR3's broad compatibility is helpful, Nvidia still has an edge in response time, at least until AMD can get their anti-lag feature working properly with frame generation on. So let's hope AMD can fix what's ailing FSR3, and according to Frank from the Radeon team, updates are on the way soon. Godspeed. Here's another follow-up from last week. The French Competition Authority raided Nvidia's offices over in the land of powdered croissants and marmalade last Wednesday, and now the EU is piling on with its own investigation, albeit an informal one. There are concerns about anti-competitive behaviors in the burgeoning AI chip arena, where Nvidia is undoubtedly the front runner, but is Nvidia's position simply the natural result of them kicking AI ass, or have they engaged in subterfuge and skullduggery to thwart their would-be competition? This certainly wouldn't be the first example of such behavior in the industry, if true. For example, only about two weeks ago, Intel was forced to finally pay a $400 million fine stemming from their anti-competitive practices, pushing AMD around, basically, between November 2002 and December 2006. So maybe in 20 years, Nvidia will get what's coming to them as well, allegedly. Here's a bit of industry news. According to the Korean business publication Chosun Biz, 
TSMC and Samsung are having problems with yields on their three nanometer nodes. TSMC has between three and five three nanometer nodes going, and Samsung has three. And while they've been up and running in some capacity for about a year, yields are still in the 50 to 60% range with anything below 70% deemed very poor by industry standards. Time will tell if TSMC and Samsung can make the necessary tweaks to pump those yield numbers up, especially if we want to retain hope that next gen GPUs like Nvidia's RTX 50 series will be available with decent volume as they are rumored to make use of three nanometer technology. Lastly, I want to inform you all of some sad news, and I know this will affect quite a few of my regular viewers. My friends, it saddens me to let you know that your first generation Apple smartwatches, and I know many of you sprung for the solid gold versions that went for ten to $17,000, are now obsolete. Sure, you were likely disappointed when Apple discontinued software updates for these devices in 2018, only three years after their debut, but long-term plans that might have included reselling them for a tidy sum have now been dashed as well leaving you poor, hapless customers who were able to afford spending five figures on a watch in 2015 out in the cold. I guess there's no recourse now except to package those tragic paperweights up and ship them over to my P.O. box, which is listed in the video's description, because while your Apple Watch might be worthless now, I guarantee that my gratitude to you, much like the armband and several other choice components on that watch, is worth its weight in gold. So there you have it guys, tech news for the week, and if you liked it, click that like button or leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the video's description if you're interested, and you can check out my store at paulsharbread.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. Subscribing to my channel is always a good call too. Thanks again everyone, and we'll see you next week.